I basically signed my offer without knowing that I'd be living on a drilling rig for two to five years of my career. You're going to either be able to go do it or shit, learn a lot along the way. A lot of people like see these movies where there's massive well blowouts and fires and explosions. Those are very dangerous and a very big part of my job to make sure that that doesn't happen. GMAT or GRE? GRE all the way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> my score, oh my God. A 326. The main reason that I wanted to get an MBA was to pivot into climate tech. And I'm drilling and working over wells or producing heavy oil. Part of me like couldn't really reconcile with this like cognitive dissonance, providing affordable and abundant energy for the world, but somehow I'm supposed to, you know, electrify the drilling rig, attach operations to the power grid to like electrify everything. And at the end of the day, like the dollars and cents from the carbon accounting perspective didn't really make sense to me. What am I really doing with my career? Welcome to Cherie's Corner, a podcast where we dive into the topic of career and hear from my friends and guests who are killing it in the business world so we can learn from their lessons, their wisdom, and their mistakes. I'm your host, Cherie. And currently, I'm a business school student at Stanford University. Previously, I've held roles in tech and venture capital. In this episode, I interview my classmate, Katie Dickinson. Katie studied petroleum engineering in college, and her first job out of school was working on an oil rig. We talk about what that experience was like, how it was being the youngest person on her team, and what it's like working in a very male-dominated field. And Katie explains her aha light bulb moment when she figured she wanted to pivot into clean energy after working in heavy oil for years. Finally, Katie gives us an inside look into her application process. She applied to six schools. Let's dive in. My name is Katie Dickinson. Um, I grew up in Houston, Texas. I went to Texas A&M University, um, did the very typical Texas thing, studied petroleum engineering, and then my early career was spent working as a drilling engineer with Chevron. I think it's the very typical Texas thing, but I've never met anyone else who studied petroleum engineering. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more about what that is or what the study is? Petroleum engineering is really fascinating because you're actually learning like the very typical engineering fundamentals, right? So you're learning physics and chemistry and like fluid dynamics, mm -hmm. but you're doing that and studying it like 10,000 feet underneath the ground, right? So you're quite literally learning it under pressure um, oh, like and that. temperature. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in the hot seat um, yeah. and under pressure, um, yeah. but no, it's, it's, it's a great, I, I really enjoyed it. And the reason I stuck with it was because we used the reservoir as essentially a case study. I just felt like it was such a rich educational experience because what you're learning in the textbook was learned through empirical evidence, trial and error. Mm -hmm. You actually get to go out and see what you're learning like in person, like out on site on the rig. Mm -hmm. And then you don't actually get to put a camera down hole and like figure out what's going on with the rock like that far underneath the ground. So you actually gather data and then you have to like do essentially like history matching to like figure out were the guesses that we made actually accurate mm. or how can we tweak it to make sure that we do have accuracy. How did you know you wanted to study that? I actually really thought I wanted to be a doctor. I had grown up thinking that that was the best way to help the most people. When I went to college, I realized that I wouldn't be able to make an impact for like 10 plus years, mm -hmm. right? After you do residency and fellowship and everything. So I ended up polling a lot of my friends' parents and all of them were in oil and gas. My parents are not. My mom is a teacher, an elementary school teacher. And my dad is an air traffic control technician, essentially make sure that all the software for air traffic controllers is working. Cool. So I didn't really have a whole lot of a lot of exposure to industry. Mm. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, to do with my life other than, oh, I can go be a teacher or I can, I don't know, go be a firefighter, like a policeman. Yeah. Like I just had the very traditional sense of what a career Or like was the jobs that are like closest to us when we're like children. It's like, oh, I want to be a teacher because like I know that there are teachers. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and so I, you know, ran down the list and I asked, like I said, a lot of my friends' um, parents, and they were like, oh my gosh, we've worked for Shell for 20 years. They've moved us all over the world. We work on new problems every single day. It's complex. It's challenging. You have everything it takes to make a great petroleum engineer. 
And that really sold me. Um, and then I also heard some not so great advice of like, the, the phrasing was, oh, it's better to be super specialized early in your career, which I would amend and not I probably wouldn't recommend a petroleum engineering degree today. Um, I think it's kind of like Ricky, my fiance, always says this. It's like learning how to drive a stagecoach and then the Model T comes out, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like the petroleum engineering degree and curriculum is not moving fast enough for the world that we live in today. Um, and I would recommend to a budding engineer something like mechanical or chemical. Um, but at the time that I was making the decision, that's the advice that I heard. So I acted with it and no regrets. <laughs> yeah. And then so following college, could you talk a little bit more about your role or roles that you were in before coming to business school? Absolutely. So when I started full time, I signed the dotted line. I moved up to Pennsylvania and I was expecting to be a drilling engineer. And as a drilling engineer, you do spend a lot of time in the field, um, to be sure. I wasn't expecting necessarily to live out on the rig. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Pennsylvania and I remember, I'll never forget, I had an incredible manager, maybe she's listening. Um, <laughs> and she was like, um, Katie, get excited, pack your bags, you're gonna be assigned to rig 529. And I was like, what? What do you mean? Yeah. She was like, oh yeah, you're going to be like moving out there. Like take one of the white Jeeps, pack your bags and like go live out there for two weeks. So what was that like? It was definitely a shell shock at first. I basically signed my offer without knowing that I'd be living on a drilling rig for two to five years of my career. But wow, I had, I'll never, like my first day in the field, I had like four different people I was meeting out on site. They were anywhere from like 30 to 45 years old, mm. all men. And they just like totally took me under their wing. They were like, hey, look, we know this isn't easy. Like you're the only female in this role and position at the time. You're by far the youngest on the rig. And like individually, they each pulled me aside and said something along the lines of like, we always have your back. Please come to us. We're a team. The role that I was in at the time, it's called a a drill site representative mm -hmm. and colloquially it's known as a company man mm -hmm. and those are the only chevron representatives on site a company woman company woman <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah and when i started this role chevron had just started this new program like relatively recently where they had new hires who were drilling engineering track mm -hmm. hires they had them go live out on the rig for two to five years of their career for two weeks on two weeks off and the purpose of that was that we would get actual real rig experience before we went and wrote procedures. Mm -hmm. We're so much better of a drilling engineer after you've seen what you're writing for. Mm -hmm. The company man position is traditionally a role held by someone who's been out on the rig since they were 18 years old. Mm -hmm. um, they've worked every single position on site. They have lived rig life for the 20 plus years and then I'm coming in as like a, an undergrad new hire. So it was definitely like, you know, you're building the plane as you're flying it and you're learning a lot as you, yeah. as you go. It was a really awesome program. And yeah. A lot. If you could explain to like a third grader or someone who like doesn't know anything about like oil and gas, but like what is rig life like? Ooh, life out there is very structured. Um, so we work 12 hour shifts. So I can maybe walk through like yeah. my day. Yeah, like, in a life of a company woman living on an oil rig. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Let's say for example's sake, I'm working a night shift. So I would wake up actually around 4 p.m. in the afternoon, try to run <laughs> or work out of any kind. Yeah. <laughs> and I would eat breakfast. I would then get, eat breakfast, <laughs> AKA dinner, AKA dinner. It was very odd. Actually. That was a big adjustment for me was my like stomach was like all upset. Yeah. The first like few hitches you do, mm -hmm. you know, first like three months or so of working this, this job, like you're waking up around dinner time, someone's cooked dinner. Mm -hmm. So you're going to probably eat dinner, mm -hmm. but you're not feeling hungry for dinner. What am I even hungry for right now? Like, I feel so weird. I didn't have breakfast. I'm like chugging coffee since, you know, 4 p.m. Um, so very, very odd uh, on the, on the, as far as the, the eating and sleeping schedule goes. But I would wake up, would go um, 
do handover with the person who had worked days. So me and the person that I worked very closely with, his name was Evan, we would talk from 5 to 5.30. He would give me the full tea on like what happened that day, right? Like this person came to deliver this piece of equipment, everything under the sun from where we're at in operations to how the team is doing. And then at 5.30, we would do a pre-tower, which is what we call the meeting with the crew that's going to be coming on for the evening. Mm-hmm. So we'd print off like a like an agenda to go over. We'd have like key things that maybe the driller needed um, for that day or needs for that day. And then after that, we would um, we'd get kicked off. So they would go hand over with the crew that's coming off. Mm-hmm. The coming off crew would do like a debrief meeting with us. So a lot of meetings, even on the rig, mm-hmm. to make sure that you have those like three points of communication. Um, so you're giving an order, someone's repeating that order back to you, and you're confirming that that's the right order for like all the communication that's done mm-hmm. on site. And then our day would get started. So we would, I would do like a, a ton of reporting. So a lot of it was manual. Mm-hmm. I would spend a lot of my day like out shoulder to shoulder with my crew. So whether we were doing something that was really critical. I definitely was outside or if it was just something I wanted to learn, I would, you know, be out there and observing and helping sometimes even doing, there's a fun picture. I'll send it to you of me in the driller's chair. I got to drill one foot. Um, (laughs) It was awesome. You literally just literally like a, like you're driving a go-kart, you know, you'd push the, like a knob forward and top drive would, (laughs) would go down a bit. So, I mean, you drilled one foot, but then they're drilling like miles. Yes. Yeah. Miles and miles down. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So the wells that we typically drilled in Pennsylvania were anywhere from about like 6,000 feet deep mm-hmm. to 10,000, even 20,000 feet out. That was actually, we, we drilled a 26,900-ish foot well in Pennsylvania. I should have that number memorized because <laughs> we broke a record at the time. Oh, wow. But that's like quite a few miles. Is life on the oil rig dangerous? Yes, it is. It definitely is. Safety is like paramount out there. It's the first thing you talk about when you're opening a meeting. You're understanding like, how could this affect me? How could this affect my crew? A phrase that we would say often to each other is, you know, we want we want everyone to get back home to their families at the end of the day, right? So mm-hmm. that was like an underlying like value for us. When you've spent years out there, um, as I have, you begin to learn that like a lot of the safety um, measures that are taken were written in blood, as like dramatic as that sounds. So from like accidents that happened and like, what can we do to make sure this never happens? Totally. That's exactly it. You know, anytime we would even have a near miss, which is something that didn't happen but could have happened Mm -hmm. let's say you have um, something drop from you know 50 feet or 100 Mm -hmm. feet that's considered a near miss even a even a you know nail if that fell from that height could like really hurt someone right so we do entire like reporting um uh, you know around a, a near miss and we talk about safeguards that are in place and like how can we prevent this from happening in the future and what what was in place that prevented that from actually being an incident. So that was a huge part of my job as a company woman was that you are the safety rep out there. Your crew is looking at you to make sure that you're guiding them. What are the dangerous aspects? Like you mentioned, like, I guess like heavy machinery or just like being around things that are like really heavy, like hoisted up in the air, like that could fall on people. Like what are the, the, the dangers actually of being in the field? Definitely heavy machinery. We're dealing with equipment 24 7 Mm -hmm. when we're out in the field. A lot of people like see these movies where there's massive well blowouts and fires and explosions. Those are very rare, very dangerous, and a very big part of my job to make sure that that doesn't happen. But actually, how we coach our crew into having this sensitivity towards like what in my day to day is dangerous and how can I like be a safe you know work member team member it's the simple things that can be dangerous like a lot of the fluids that you're moving around on site are actually under like quite a lot of pressure mm-hmm. whether they're coming up from out of the hole under a lot of pressure um like from your well or just are under pressure on site we act like every every piece of pipe every valve has pressure behind it because it it allows you to double, triple, quadruple check that when you're opening a valve, it doesn't have pressure behind it because that can cause 
a incident. And, you know, it's just normal humans working with normal humans. So you get cut scratches and bruises and we take those very seriously, you know, like if someone trips and falls, like that's a tripping hazard, right? And that's like on us for not having done the walkthroughs to make sure that even the simple things are mm -hmm. are safe for our workers, you know. What was it like being in a very male dominated field, especially so early on in your career? Well, I think at first I was I was very nervous. I think I came in with some, you know, preconceived notions of like, this is how my experience is going to go because I'm a woman and I put up a lot of like armor and we just was very anxious about it mm. um, before I before I even started the job. Um, and I would say generally in oil and gas, in the specific, specific role that I was in, which has the caveat of being like the leader on the rig, like you are king of the rig <laughs> when you're the company man. So no one's going to mess with you mm -hmm. when you are the person that they're reporting to for the most part. So that is a place of privilege in a way. I generally had extremely positive, um, really, really positive interactions. I had, like I said, very incredible mentors um, who held a, who held space for how much more difficult it was for me being out there. I'll never forget, like one time I walked up to a crew of four guys, it's my rig crew, a motor hand, floorman, walking up and I'm like, hey, what's up guys? And they just like, all start blushing and go like radio silent. What were they, what were y'all talking about? And just like, they kind of jumped back into their conversation. I realized they were talking about how they went to a strip club the night before in like <laughs> downtown Moundsville, which is a very small town in West Virginia. That is an example of how like, even though everyone is like super open, like mm -hmm. very cordial, very respectful of me for the most part, there are moments where you're kind of like left out yeah. because they're, thank God, not going to talk about that in front of me, right? But yeah, there's just, you can't relate on the same way. Now, that is not a healthy way to be relating in the workplace, but mm -hmm. um, it's, I think, an example of like, you know, when everyone would be all like excited about something that's like very dude culture-ish. Yeah. Like I just, I couldn't totally relate, but I did a lot to try to like bridge those gaps. Like I, I got really into smoking meats. Um, <laughs> Paul to Mark Zuckerberg, like barbecuing. <laughs> like barbecuing. Yeah. So we had a smoker that was made out of steel casing that we actually use in the well. We had like scrap metal. We had someone turn it into a smoker, massive smoker. We're talking like, I think it was like 20 inch pipe, right? So it's huge. Um, and this was like welded by like welders we knew and like it was gifted to the rig. Um, fun. Very fun. And we always joked that it was like a $20,000 smoker because the, the material and yeah. the welding, welding is very expensive. So we always would joke that it was our like super fancy smoker. I started cooking briskets, pork shoulders, ribs. Oh my God, fun. And it was communal. So like- You can share it. You can share it. Exactly. Yeah. So- it was a great way to break bread, like with my crew and earn their respect because they're like, damn, Katie, this is some good brisket. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, while also like relating that. to them, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of them are dads, they're cooking and grilling out, you know, yeah. in their home off hitch. So it was great. Now at Stanford, you're focused more on the green side of things. Could you talk more about that transition? Chevron moved me to Bakersfield, California, and that's really when I started to see one like climate change just felt like here. On top of that, one of our um, performance pillars for the year that I started in Bakersfield was lower carbon. And I'm drilling and working over wells or producing heavy oil. And so a part of me like couldn't really reconcile with this like cognitive dissonance. Like I get the idea and I, I you know, don't, I don't want to like continue to feed the fire of like, you know, hate towards these companies that are providing affordable and abundant energy for the world. But we're drilling and producing heavy oil and somehow I'm supposed to, you know, electrify the drilling rig or, you know, um, attach operations to the power grid to like electrify everything. And at the end of the day, like the dollars and cents from the carbon accounting perspective didn't really make sense to me. And that was kind of like the first spidey sense of like, what am I really doing with my career? I really started to wrestle with this. And you started, I started to see the writing on the wall within Chevron. We, we opened up a new business unit in 2018 called um, 
new energy. So it's an entire business unit that's devoted to like the clean tech future, right? So they're investing in biofuels and, um, and you know, just alternative energies, renewables, all this stuff, um, hydrogen. I've started vocalizing, like, I would like to move into one of those two groups. Mm. Um, and my boss was like, that's awesome, Katie. Great. It's going to take about 10 years to do that. And I was like, wow, I really... Why? They, so the way the career ladders work, or at least how mine was working at the time, was the move from a drilling engineer to an investor within Chevron, I don't mm-hmm. even think is like... like- a charted path charted okay. path exactly yeah, I see, I see. and as such a like new career like in the new career bucket that i was in like, you don't have as much ability to like make a big jump like that from as like to like someone who's been there for like 30 years exactly who kind of gets their pick of the litter when it sure. comes to like roles like that and you know new energies and chevron tech ventures was really hot at the time mm-hmm. so like i'm asking to like m- be to move into a function after they've spent, you know, probably half a million or more dollars training me mm. to just like jump ship from drilling engineering. And so it doesn't really make sense from like a, a um, business. business need. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I really started to think like, well, why don't I just take matters into my own hands? Mm. And I met two very key people that helped nudge me towards pursuing an MBA program as like a way to pivot into climate tech. A friend, Casey Prohaska, who um, she's probably going to listen to this someday. And I met her and like two weeks later, she gets into Stanford. Mm-hmm. And I was like, one can do that. Like, mm-hmm. that is insane. And yeah. she was like crushing it at her job. But like, I think like me saw the writing on the wall and really started to like think like, okay, well, if I'm not going to do this now, when am I going to? And and then I also met my now fiance at the time when I moved to California. And literally one of the first times we talked on the phone, he was like, you like have to apply to mm-hmm. business school. Specifically, he said, you have to apply to Stanford. I think the more I dug into like what would a career post MBA in climate tech look like, mm-hmm. the the doors just fully opened. And I was like, wow, you can just, you can do whatever you want. It's awesome you know, people at the company, what is the sentiment? And I would say it was, it was really split. Like I worked with people of like the entire spectrum of political ideologies. At the end of the day, everyone, you know, they're working for Chevron and believe that there is like good to be done in the world with this company. And, and, and I, I believe that, right? Like we wouldn't have the luxuries that we have today. We wouldn't have the medicine we have today. And so I think it's this interesting, like for someone working at an oil and gas company who does believe that climate is changing, um, because there's so many people who don't, um, but you know, for those of us who, who believe those two things, you're, you're always in tension, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, and you understand how nuanced this challenge is of how do we transition the world and decarbonize the economy also not like totally you know, cutting off our like resources Mm -hmm. and ability to enjoy the lives that we have. So yeah, I would say it's definitely a mixed bag. The main reason that I wanted to get an MBA was to pivot into climate tech. I had an incredible opportunity to work for the person who was my alumni contact when I got in. He was the one who called me, Katie, what can I do to convince you to go to Stanford? And he was looking for a chief of staff at the time and didn't really have the time to hire someone for that role. So um, he invited me to come work for him for the summer. The company is called Fervo Energy. They're based in Houston. And so even before I started the MBA, I was able to really like use the, you know, Stanford Mm -hmm. network and the Stanford ecosystem to already start to pivot my career. Fervo actually is a geothermal developer. So I was able to use my skill set of drilling engineering and actually apply that to my day-to-day life at right. Fervo. And it was very exciting. So that was a great first step in the right direction. And then got to see our Series C raised over the course of last summer and um, was really fascinated with the process. Mm-hmm. That was the inspiration for me to see the other side of the table, right? Like, what is the investor perspective like? So since I've been at Stanford, I've been very intentional about trying to learn climate tech investing and Mm. specifically, you know, which stage do I really enjoy? I think that informs both, you know, do you like investing or not? And Mm. also, like, 
what stage of a company would you want to be at if you decide to go into operations, um, if you decide not to start your own thing. So trying to answer all those questions for myself still, but I'm in climate tech VC for the summer and I'm absolutely loving it. And so for people who are applying to MBA programs right now, what is one piece of advice you would give them in their application process? Wow really doing the hard work of sitting down and thinking about what you want to get from the MBA, right? And also like doing the self-reflection of like, why did I do the things that I did in my career to get me to this place today? And then asking the why to that why and doing that like four or five times to really get to the root of it, right? Like if you look at my career, like a lot of my choices were rooted in like financial insecurity from a young age. Right. And like not knowing, like feeling very anxious around like our household's financial like standing. Mm -hmm. That was a huge reason why I chose petroleum engineering. And so, you know, when people are like, Oh, well, how ethical is it that you did, you know, petroleum engineering and how ethical is it working for an oil and gas company? Well, at the time that I was making my decision, like that wasn't, a really huge factor for me right mm-hmm. and I think if I'd been in a totally different place like if my family had been in a different place like I would have been able to have the freedom to have make it to make different decisions but yeah knowing and being like vulnerable about that right like you know it's not easy or fun work to do necessarily at first but I think that that really lays the foundation for like why is getting this MBA actually going to help me and what can I do to like kick off that process in like the best possible way? You know, mm-hmm. know thyself. Know thyself. <laughs> and don't be afraid to know thyself. Yes. It's a very scary process, but as you're doing the MBA application and also just some self reflection, like only good can come out of that. Totally, totally. Even if it ends up with a no from, yeah. you know, the application process, which many, many of us have heard many, many no's even in the MBA program. Um, But, you know, if that, if that's what the conclusion is, you're going to have learned so much about yourself during the process. Nothing but good can come from that. Mm -hmm. And so which schools did you end up applying to? So I applied to Stanford, Harvard. I have to like think about this now. Um, Wharton, MIT, Yale, and Berkeley. Wow. So that's six. a lot of applications. How long did that yeah. take? 10 months. Mm-hmm. I spent all of my time and money on my Stanford application. I hired an admissions consultant, which was the best money I ever spent. Great. Um, it's essentially like paying someone to be your mirror and like actually give you like, hey, this like these words like tweak this a little bit. Like something sounds off here, right? And just really bringing out your voice is mm-hmm. really awesome. You know, pick a school that like is your dream school and like crush it on that application and then use those learnings to complete the other ones, right? And what has surprised you most about the MBA experience in the last nine months? How much work there is. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'm like an odd one because I do feel like Some people are having like the time of their lives, but it's because they did like a lot of very hard work before the MBA and... Or they have experience doing this type of schoolwork that we're learning for the first time. Totally. (laughs) Um, Not having come from a business degree, it's definitely a lot of work from like the actual education of it. It's truly drinking from a fire hose. Like there's too much opportunity and too many awesome things and not enough time. Um... And so that has been the most surprising thing. I mean... Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of busy work in the first year as well from a required classes. My favorite class was Peter DeMarzo's corporate financial modeling class, which is like maybe a hot take. I did not come from finance, as y'all now know. Um, And that is supposed to be like the closest thing to investment banking without actually doing investment banking. I learned a ton. Peter DeMarzo is a phenomenal instructor. He's like patient, calm, like very relaxed, but it's a very difficult class. So it's this like interesting yin yin and yang. That class, people like had to spend all Wednesday, like maybe like 12 hours every Wednesday doing the work for that class. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, It's like, it's like definitely 20 hours a week of work for that one class Mind you, you're taking like five to seven classes, right? Mm -hmm. A a quarter. So it was a lot. Everyone warned me of that before. So I had that going in. I'm going to be devoting a lot of time to this class. 
And then you build your schedule around it, right? If you're smart. Mm. And then, so I think we'll move on to life topics. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Katie, what is your relationship status? I am engaged. Woo! Yay. <laughs> I found him. And so what has life been like over the last nine months being a student and having your partner live with you on campus? Oh, we absolutely love it. Our situation's a little, a little unique in that Ricky had done an MBA program before moving here on campus with me. So because of that, he like kind of knows the, the shtick. Like Mm -hmm. he knew that it would be like very socially intense. He knew that you know, classes would be a lot more than one expects from a, from an MBA program. And so he really like helped me prepare mentally for this and, and would held up a mirror of like, this is very normal, you know, for you to be feeling these like really high highs and then kind of like low lows at yeah, points, you know, so grounding. Yeah. Super grounding without him here. I, I, I really think it would have been like a much harder transition. We do live on campus um, and we're staying on campus for the coming year. We're in a 450 square foot apartment. Oh my gosh. So things are very tight. And I feel like if we can survive that, then we're, you know, we're good. We're set. Set So yeah. How would you describe like the social scene um, at Stanford GSB? Wow. Okay. So the social scene is like insane. It is so much like I like the so much is should be like (laughs) the theme there is always something that you could be doing and that's like the beautiful thing i think about the social aspects of the gsb and some people find their tribe and they gel and that that is like their crew and other people they're like man you know on wednesdays i hang out with like the surfers and on the other days i hang out with you know the people that we're studying accounting together with like and and i fall into that category of like i hope i'm a floater like Mm -hmm. in a way where there's just so many people here and there's no way to become best friends with all 424 people in our class, but damn, am I going to try? You know what I mean? And it's a really, really incredible chance in life to meet like-minded individuals who, you know, you get to share this incredible experience with. So socially it's been awesome. It's also very challenging. I mean, there's moments where you get on Be Real and like you aren't at that dinner and you're like, shit, everyone hates me. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Um, and the more you realize like it is not, a, it is not a me thing. And like, even if it is like, whatever, there's 424 people in this class. It's not like, a you thing. <laughs> I think sure we, I thought like I graduated from high school and never had to deal with that like FOMO again. Yeah. And being able to like, w- like really sink teeth into it as an adult and like really like peel back the layers of like, where is my worth and mm-hmm. why am I like triggered why am I like going back to my 18 year old self yeah. in this moment is really awesome. So I'm also even the hard so things. Awesome. So, awesome. so awesome. So awesome. <laughs> so even the hard things, there's things to learn from them, yeah. you know? So this one is one of the more like deeper questions that I ask. Um, what is something that you've learned about yourself over the last year? Oh man, man, I really should have prepared this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, continue to prove to myself that I can do hard things. And I think I really have been hard on myself when I look in the past on not knowing something. You can't help but compare yourself to everyone else in the room. And you're like, wow, I'm so dumb. And that like internal voice, I've proven to myself over the course of the last year at Stanford that, yeah, maybe I don't know accounting, but wow, when I like really put my head down and like had to learn like the skills needed to do VC. Like I was able to learn that because I feel like no one tells you how the recruiting process is going to go. And like every single application is a bespoke like investment memo or thesis. And there's no like process. I think having that muscle of like, this is very hard, but I'm learning this right now. And I'm going to be better at it the next time. It isn't like perfect the next time, but then you just slowly like chip away at like learning this new skill. You're going to either be able to go do it or shit, learn a lot along the way. The ability to really set a goal and just like absolutely like chase it, you Mm. know. That's very growth mindset of you. Yes. (laughs) Our last section is called Bills, Bills, Bills. Ooh! We're (laughs) financing the MBA 
process can be quite complicated. So if you could break it down like percentage wise, how would that break down for you? Ooh. Yeah, so I um, I did apply to financial aid, and everyone should. I was shocked when Stanford thought I was very poor before the MBA. Um, I think that just speaks to, yeah, where people are coming from in your class. Like, that was really shocking for me. So, like, 33% of my tuition is um, a fellowship. It's a fellowship, but it's it's completely need-based. Okay. Financial aid. Yes, financial aid. Um, it, at Stanford, they call it a fellowship. Okay. Don't know why. You do get to write a letter to your fellow. So I've actually met really awesome people like through those um, individuals that contributed to you know sponsoring um, GSB students. And then the other sixty six percent, I was essentially exclusively taking out loans. For me, using like all of my savings to pay for the two years just felt uncomfortable. For me, it felt best to keep my savings where they were. The market was really down. So like, instead of taking out at a, at a like valley, like why not, you know, just let that ride out for the end of time. Yeah. Well, this was awesome. I, it felt like it didn't even really feel like there was a camera there. Yes. It's awesome. That's showbiz baby. You got lights, you got lights, camera action. Let's go. Thank you for tuning in for this episode of Cherie's Corner. There is only one more episode left before we wrap up this season. Please like, comment, and subscribe. As I'm preparing for season two in the fall, please let me know if there are specific students at Stanford or other industries you'd like me to focus on. I've already fielded some requests of people who want to hear from those who have a finance background. I'm kind of looking for that feedback so I know who to invite and find people with backgrounds you're interested in hearing from. I'd also really appreciate if you can share this episode of Cherie's Corner with someone who you think would find this content helpful. And before we dive into the final takeaways, I want to say hello from Japan. I'm currently recording from my matcha farm internship. I'm living and working on a Japanese green tea farm for the next several weeks, and if this is new to you, please go to my account and watch my vlogs. You'll find out more information about my Stanford internship here and what exactly I'm doing for the next month. Okay, let's get into the takeaways. The first big takeaway of the conversation with Katie is around career pivot. It's crazy to think that the job that you're doing when you're 22 will be the exact same job that you'll be doing when you're 45 or 50 years old. Career pivots are normal. And many people use the MBA experience as a way to pivot into a new role, a new industry, or to try something different. As you heard from Katie, she's using this two year time period to experiment with new things, like trying out her role of chief of staff, experimenting with Climate Tech VC, and seeing which aspects she likes and doesn't like and which ones she finds personally fulfilling. On average, MBA students have five years of work experience. I think honestly, as people in our late 20s, we're looking for roles and jobs and work that we just find more fulfilling, that we can see ourselves pursuing for the next decade. If you're thinking about pivoting your career, the MBA could be a good way to do so. The second big learning from the conversation with Katie is embracing cognitive dissonance. I loved Katie's story about how she came to the understanding that she wanted to pivot. She worked in heavy oil for many years, but ultimately found that the industry didn't align with her personal values. That's a really scary thing to realize, let's be honest. And she was able to reflect and really embrace the cognitive dissonance to figure out what she finds meaningful. And the easy thing would be to push away the discomfort and leave that for later. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to touch that. But it's essential to sit with our conflicting feelings when our actions don't fully align with our values. It opens up a whole new door of growth and self-discovery. And isn't that what life is all about? Reflecting and being introspective and how to be more closely aligned with our authentic selves. I just love that story. I'm really big on meditation and mindfulness and really knowing yourself and not being afraid to know yourself. What gives you energy? What drains you energy? And if you're going to be working on a project, on a team, in an industry that's really draining your energy and you really have to do the mental gymnastics to be like, oh, this is why it matters or this is why the mission matters. It could be that it's not the right fit for you, at least for right now. And a lot of people find meaning in separating their work and their personal lives. And that's totally fine. But I find when I'm able to reconcile both of them so that they're both more aligned with what fulfills me and gives me energy, I'm a much happier person. I'm not saying that this is the right way, but it's something to think about. Okay, and the last and final takeaway from this conversation 
is that the social scene in business school is tough but rewarding. The MBA experience is inherently social. There is something to do every single night. Does that scare you or excite you? On one end, the social scene is extremely rewarding because you're meeting friends, business partners, people who will be in your network for the rest of your life. But on the other side, it's important to recognize that there is such thing as social burnout. And a lot of the social pressures in business school can honestly feel like high school again. It's important to go into the experience with a very open mind and know what you wanna get out of it and have a moment before the MBA program where you set up healthy boundaries for yourself and figure out how you personally deal in social situations and with FOMO, because that is something that every MBA student, no matter where you go, will have to face. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Cherie's Corner. Stay tuned for the last and final podcast episode coming out next Sunday. I'll see you soon. Bye.